Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. Anthony, we just wrapped up our interview with Brian Bloom, CPA. And what's the takeaway you had here? First of all, it's always a good time when we have another CPA on here. Right? Yeah, you yeah. know we're going to be in for some laughs and some spot, spot, spontaneity. Um, but my takeaway is, you know, he was talking about how much effort is focused on rates of return. But you can't take that rate of return and go to the grocery store and buy food. Mm -hmm. Or your doctor is not going to take your rate of return as a payment, but they will take dollars. So it's, it's another thing like what Nelson had talked about. It's not about the volume of interest or I'm not, it's not about the rate of interest. It's a volume of inter interest. The amount of dollars we're going to have at the end of the day is what's key, not n necessarily the, the rates of return to get there. What was your takeaway, Cam? I had two of them. Mm, uh -oh. The first one <laughs> was how he described all CPAs as arrogant and cheap. <laughs> that was funny because it's true. <laughs> and the second takeaway I had was, uh, man, I've read his book series uh, many years ago. I've been a longtime fan of his. But when he gets in there talking about how whole life insurance, it's a hard to calculate asset. So it's very difficult to assign kind of a rate of return to it because it has so many different features. And a lot of times we get lost when we're explaining kind of the benefits uh, to this strategy using whole life insurance. And uh, you know, we call it the and asset, but there's just so many things that, you know, that is an intangible that's very difficult to assign value to. And he's got a great way of doing that. Uh, his term that he uses is called the capital equivalent value, and he's got an entire book on it. It's his third book in the series. Today we touch on it a little bit, but uh, if anybody's listening, I would absolutely recommend that you guys get his uh, book and the entire series, and I'll make sure that we uh, put a link in the show notes. Enjoy the episode. Take care. Brian, we are excited to have you back. Uh, I know you've got some updates that we're going to address with our audience, but... Uh, Man, the last time we had you, very well received, so we are excited that you're joining us again. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Brian, if you could just start with our audience has grown quite a bit. If you could maybe just give us a little bit of background of your background of kind of how you got into the accounting field. Sure. As long as nobody starts adding up all these years, I'm, I'm good with telling you how it all got started <laughs> way, way back when. But, but I, I started my career after getting a uh, a, a bachelor's degree in accountancy at the University of Illinois. And I started out immediately um, with, with a job in accountancy. And I started working for a group called the State University's Retirement System of Illinois. So that's a public employee retirement system. And I started to learn all the ins and outs of the public retirement benefits that are available to state and local employees. Work my way up uh, from from staff accountant to chief accountant and deputy executive director and the chief financial officer of the group. And things can you imagine in Illinois things got political? Well, got political, and you know we we were running into lots of problems. And my last job there was to do conduct the executive search for the new executive director of the of the system and I knew who they were looking for and I knew it wasn't going to work with me and so we hired the guy and I quit the next day. So I went off then into the private side of all of this to just mm -hmm. get an idea of how do private retirement systems work like 401ks and IRAs and 403 mm -hmm. that type of stuff and I did I worked for an accounting firm and I was as you guys would know as a third party administrator a TPA and uh, that that worked for five years and um, I started to um, begin to question I'm going what what what's going on here and I got out of the retirement planning perspective and I got into financial planning and I, I joined a friend of mine and who had a financial planning uh, company and I started doing work one-on-one -on -one with individuals and I quickly began to realize that what I was taught to be true has turned out not to be mm. in how do you plan your finances? And my career has evolved ever since then, working one-on-one -on -one with individuals, um, now to the point of coaching other financial advisors um, to help them discover what's really true and what's not. And in the midst of that, I started writing some books. And um, there's now three of them um, out uh, in the nonfiction 
arena and there's a fiction book coming out uh in the spring and there and there they are by the way <laughs> awesome now, oh. now that that green cover book was just updated this year because it's 10 years old i can't is ever... it really so yeah and so i thought well you know let's update some of the numbers um mm. Let's let's take some of the lessons we learned in COVID and incorporate that in there. And then we started to take a look at some of the tax implications of what happens in financial planning. So Okay. That is a lot to unpack. Yeah. But Brian, <laughs> what I'd like to drill a little deeper on when you made the comment when you were kind of looking more into these retirement plans, you found out some things that you were told to be true just weren't true do you mind expanding or giving some examples on on those yeah because it, it was it was working you know in in my own finances i wasn't just finding it in other people's finances <laughs> in my own and you know then it really gets personal but you know a lot of talk is all about your rate of return and you know you might get a 30 or 40 percent rate but guess what if you don't have any money who cares mm. and in our early years of, of of developing financial planning you know uh, we don't have a lot of money. And then once you start to get some money, then you realize, okay, now this is work, but why is it as, why isn't it growing? Like I thought it was, I thought I was going to average, you know, 12% return every year. And then I started realizing that what they talk about as averages is not what you get. And that was probably the first revelation that, that the actual rate of return is nowhere near the average rate of return. And that's what we shape all our expectations on. Hmm. Awesome. What what else? Anything else that kind of jumped out at you? We love talking about yeah. average versus actual. Anything else that kind of jumped out at you, Brian? Well, then I began to realize that I had partners in my accounts. What do you and mean? What I thought was my money mm. really wasn't my money. In fact, there was four or five other groups ahead of me when I wanted my money. So let's say, you know, I had an IRA and I was old enough to take money out without a penalty. Mm -hmm. Well, I realized that before I got a dime, I had to give some of my account to the federal government. I had to give some of my account to the state government. I realized that when I started to take money out of that IRA, it triggered taxes on my social, taxes on my social security. So I owed social security, they were a partner. And then when I took out too much money, then I, you know that free health insurance that's called yeah. Medicare? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know it's not free? What? You know, this year it cost 170 bucks a month for free health insurance, unless you take too much money out of your IRA. And then they jack it up to five, $600 a month. I didn't know that. And so these, I found out I was sixth, fifth in line. Now, if you live in a city that has an income tax, guess what? You're sixth in line because the city's going to get some. What about your county? Everyone's got their hand out for your money before you get it. You know, Brian, I appreciate you explaining that because I don't think a lot of people, I'm, well, Cameron being one of them, <laughs> understands the long-term implications, right? We're, we're taught that let's put our money in our IRA, 401k, and it's going to grow, and then we take it out. We're going to be in a lower tax bracket when we when we retire, which often I'm finding that's not the case, especially with my successful clients. But you mentioned some things people don't think about. What was that? Well, now my more my social security will now be taxed, or that paying the additional amount for. Um, Medicare. I mean, those are just additional taxes or additional people in line. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. You, you touched on 401ks, IRAs. I've heard you speak about this before, but I was hoping you can expand on it just a little bit. But the misconception of kind of being debt free in some sort of <laughs> deferred account. Could you touch on that and share with our listeners? <laughs> debt free. Yeah. The, you know, there, there's a there's a bunch of radio entertainers, financial radio entertainers out there that that talk about and, and, and I've caught them. My, my wife, I tell you what she says, I cannot listen to the radio while I'm driving. We almost landed in the ditch the one night when I heard him say that your 401k plan is tax free. I could not believe it. Oh. And nothing further from the truth 
yet a lot of people believe their 401k plan is tax free or just a client just just last week he doesn't understand why he's now paying taxes on his his ira distributions because he rolled it over he rolled over 401k to an IRA and he thought that took care of all the taxes. Oh my gosh. And that was my client. I mean, <laughs> he still, he still had that screwed up. up. Oh my goodness. But, but there's so many misconceptions on that. And oh, uh, there's Go so for it. out there talking about being debt free yet the, the, the biggest debt we have is out of our retirement account. And it's the taxes we did not pay while we were working. You know, the beauty of our country is that you're on, you only have to be taxed once on the money you earn, only once. But you get to choose when that happens. Now, if you decide to pay it while you're working, that's truly one tax. But if you decide to put it off to the future, well, now you're taxed multiple times. Let me, and just in on the federal side of things, you're taxed on the, you, you have to pay the taxes you didn't pay. And then you got to pay taxes on the growth of the taxes you didn't pay. Mm -hmm. Tax upon tax upon tax, every time you don't pay the taxes today. And, 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 and so it's, it, it just, it's a snowball going downhill. Now, now, Anthony, you you said something about that we would retire in a lower tax bracket. You know yeah. what? Even if we do retire in a lower tax bracket, you're going to pay more taxes than if you had just paid them to begin with. So explain, explain. You pay taxes on the growth. You pay mm. taxes on the growth. You know that. Uh, let's just say you're in the 25 percent tax bracket, and you've got um, a, a million dollar account. Okay. Well. Right off the bat, two hundred fifty thousand dollars of that belongs to the government. Now, anything you don't pay when it's due is called a debt. Okay, so you didn't pay your taxes when the taxes were due. You decided to pay them sometime. That's a that's a debt. Now, does the two fifty stay two fifty? The taxes you didn't pay the longest? No. Now, we all think it's because Congress might increase or decrease the tax rate. No, if the account grows, so does the 250, so does the debt. If you get a 12% return on your 401k plan, you got a 12% return on the taxes you didn't pay. <laughs> and you owe that much more. And the point is, we don't know what the government's going to end up charging as a interest rate on the debt because it's tied to the taxes that's assessed or the based on the growth of the account when you actually take it out in the future. So, you know, you, you could have a, you, you could retire in the 20% bracket while you were working in the 25% bracket, but you'd still owe more money because you'd owe it on more. You'd owe 20%, a lower rate, you'd owe it on more money because the account grew as it should have. Brian. Well, Brian, I always like to throw in a little bit. In addition to that is when people are working, their two biggest tax deductions are typically their mortgage mm -hmm. and their kids, mm -hmm. right? Fast forward and when they retire, typically the, the house is paid off or maybe it's close to it. So we lose that tax deduction. And then even if the kids are still living with us, we can't deduct them anymore. Right. So we, we're also losing our, our biggest tax deductions and that's assuming taxes stay constant, which I don't right. think anybody believes that in the long run. Right. Well, well, that's, that's your tax rate is now creeping on you because you don't have as many deductions. So Congress may not increase the tax rate, but you, but your position in life may increase your tax rate because of, like you said, you lost the deductions, you lost the kids, you, you lost everything that you need to offset the taxes that are due on the 401k plan. Right. I'm always surprised, right, is uh, how few accountants and even advisors out there kind of come to this same conclusion. Why is it that there's so few kind of CPAs out there that kind of end up coming to this same conclusion that we've come to and that you've come to? Well, it's easy. And, 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 and Anthony can he'll vouch for this. CPAs are we're, we're, we're cheap and we're arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I'm dying because it's but funny and true. Maybe use a little different <laughs> words, frugal. No, but but maybe, I'm but. telling you, <laughs> our arrogance keeps us from discovering the truth. So explain arrogance for us. Peel We're right. Up. Yeah. We're right. What are you doing questioning me? <laughs> right. And how dare you tell me I wasted my money on that education? You see, arrogance and cheapness, they go hand yeah. in hand. And that's why we that that's why my profession won't won't look at it. Arrogant and cheap. How's that, Anthony? No, that's right. I mean, again, I might use a little different words, right? <laughs> but like with N Nelson Nash, uh, it talks the the arrival syndrome, right? Yeah. That the CPAs figure that they've arrived. They don't have anything to learn. They right. know it all, which this kind of sounds like me in one of our weekly meetings and Cameron's trying to challenge me. And I'm like, <laughs> Cameron, do you know who I am? <laughs> 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 and don't spend a dime. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Don't tell me I wasted my money. Yeah, yeah. No, it's... Uh, you're right, man. I get uh, the advice that I've always given somebody is when you find some uh, an accountant out there that is the word I use is kind of proactive or forward thinking, man, they are worth their weight in gold. And there's really, really difficult to find. Right. Well, I, you know, Cameron, let me compliment you. I, I like your, your nickname, the recovering CPA. That's oh, wait, that's uh, okay. <laughs> let me see, Anthony, Anthony. <laughs> The recovering okay. CPA. Yes, Got you guys yeah. backwards. Sorry yeah. about that. You well, actually Cameron. because I'm so arrogant, I was like, "How dare you insult? How dare you? <laughs> how dare you compliment Cameron?" And, and like, <laughs> there's, there, there's compliments to be thrown around. You're gonna start with me, bro. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, That's so, a good one. There, there, there's also a, a bit more. And again, this goes back to how we're trained. We're we're trained to calculate a rate of return. Okay, and everything's based on rate of return. Now, tell me, if you went down to the grocery store and you had a bag of groceries at checkout, would would they cash your percent sign? You reach into your wallet and you pull out a percent sign, twelve percent. No. Would they be able to cash that to to cash you out of your groceries? No, not at all, right? But they take your dollars, right? But yet, rate of return is so holy, if you will that we think everything revolves around a percentage point. Well, that, that's not true at all. And then we calculate the wrong period of time. We take, we, we take, okay, you started here, you ended here. What was your rate of return from point A to point B? We, we do not calculate what it would take to get to point C at the top. So going up your accumulation in life, we don't calculate what that midpoint is. We go from, from, beginning to saving through the date of death and we go with here's your irr your internal rate of return but no one calculates what that midpoint is is at 65 what rate of return do you have to get on your savings in order to safely come back down your distribution years in retirement and that's an essential rate of return and i have yet to see a cpa or a financial planner ever calculate that now, Brian, I think I know the answer here, right? Is your third book touches on this, right? Right. So if you could share with our listeners what that, you know, what that name is and what they can learn from uh, reading that third book in your series. Right. So it's called Capital Equivalent Value, and it's used for any hard to value asset. OK, so when I talk about a hard to value asset, the asset provides certain benefits uh, in, in a way that it's just hard to calculate what that rate of return is. So what we do is we figure out a, a, an economic value for the benefits themselves. And then we back into what it would take in any other account to accomplish the same thing. So let's, for instance, let's say um, your, your account will provide you six, $60,000 a year. It's tax-free, therefore your social security is not taxable and you're not gonna get hit with that Medicare surcharge. Okay, so those are the benefits, it tax free, um, no surcharge, and no taxation on Social Security. Well, well, how do you value those squishy benefits along with the $60,000? Well, you have to go and then set up a, 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 a fake account, if you will, a, a, any other account, I don't care if it's a, 
a mutual fund account or if it's a if it's an S, a, a, a real estate account, gold, silver, whatever you want it to be, what would it have to accumulate to by the time you're ready to start to start taking distributions? What would it have to accumulate to to account for sixty thousand dollars a year tax free? What it would would take to account for you don't have to pay taxes on Social Security or at least give you enough money to pay the taxes on Social Security and give you enough money to pay the taxes or the, the surcharges on Medicare. That's called the capital equivalent value. And then you can back into the capital equivalent value rate of return that you'd have to have during your growth period in order to match this difficult to, to value asset that not only gives you money, but gives you some some perks like not having to pay taxes on it and not having to pay the Medicare surcharge. That's awesome, Brian. So kind of what I'm hearing is that we can't just focus on the numbers and the balances, right? Because some accounts are going to work differently. So we need to take into account the additional benefits uh, as well. Uh, that's good stuff, that's right? right. That, yeah, yeah that, that's exactly right. And, you know, and let's just say, the uh, difficult to value asset also uh, provides long-term care benefits as a as a side mm -hmm. benefit. Let's say it provides a a uh, some kind of disability payment in case you get disabled. Well, how, how do you get that stuff in your four hundred one k plan? Do you get that stuff in your mutual fund? Do you get that in your Roth? You don't. But you have to find a, a way to value that. Otherwise, this asset that 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 is quote unquote hard to value. You, you can't properly um, look at it in comparison to anything else. You got to got to find this capital equivalent value. Ryan, I got to give you a compliment is right. We've been doing this for quite a while, right? In this industry. And uh, again, I think I said it last time, but uh, your series of three books uh, absolutely sheds light on some of those intangibles and then also how to calculate it. I've never seen anybody kind of put it together the way that you have uh, in this series. So if somebody's out there and wants more additional information, Confessions of a CPA, I'll make sure that we have a link in our book there at the end. But uh, um, we, well, I use some calculators, right? You probably are familiar with it, uh, Truth Concepts, to maybe address some of this stuff. Are you familiar with them and some of the yeah. work that Todd has done? <clears throat> yep, absolutely. Awesome. Todd, Todd's the guy who taught me that a 0% car loan at a, or a 0% loan at a car dealership isn't 0%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm the one who taught Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> Small world. Yeah. Now, in your new book, which I'm excited to hear and to read. Um, now, you'd mentioned you do a section in regards to COVID. What, what are mm -hmm. some of the what what can we look for? What, what can we learn from that? Yeah. So the, the COVID chapter has a lot to has a lot to do with average rates of return. Mm. Uh, and, and then actually the the actual as well, because you remember we had we had an incredible dump off in what three weeks in in the market, and prior to that it was nothing but up right, and so in that chapter we talk about well what if we didn't recover from the COVID disaster? Now we did we did that that J curve we went down went right back up. Yeah. If we didn't go back up, what what did that dump off in March of 2020 do to this big? 12 year run of the stock market. Well, it almost wiped it out. And what if we didn't recover from that? And so there's gonna be an event sometime in the future. I don't know what it's gonna be. You know, 9-11 had a profound effect on our market. That was the beginning of the lost decade, 10 years it took. Now with COVID, it didn't take that long, but that's kind of what the COVID numbers in here um, talk about and and you know what if we don't recover and what are the ramifications what if you know you're a business owner mm, i was going to ask you wiped yeah. out, covid just wiped out your savings how do you pay your employees how do you pay for the overhead how do you pay for anything well we have there's there's a bunch of covid lessons and it's interesting the the people who learned the covid lessons back in 2008 the last time we had a big dump off, they still had their businesses. <laughs> they didn't have any customers, but they had their businesses. <laughs> What's funny is, uh, right we, again, we've been doing this for a while, and some of the people that are the most open to 
this IBC, this idea of IBC and putting cash away where we've got access to it are, are some of the older, some of my older clients, probably 50 plus is because they've gone through some of these market uh, downturns and they've gone through and taken some beatings over the years and they realize just how valuable it would have been to have money in these types of accounts back when. Yeah. I mean, what, what, what rate of return do you get on cash? And a check in or savings? Zero. Yeah. But yeah. cash is king, isn't it? Absolutely. Cash is king. Zero percent is the most important asset you might have because you have access to it. So I, I got a question kind of along those lines is right. Is you're talking about places to store cash. What do you say to people that ask you and say, or when you're presented with the idea that someone says, hey, whole life is a terrible place to put cash. Well, I remind them of, of you know, folks who did put cash in life insurance, like Walt Disney, um, like Jace, Jacques Panay, you know, that, gross, that, that department store. Um, I think uh, one of the uh, kitchen appliance places, I mean, there's story after story about we'll just use the disney example he he had life insurance and he had this grand idea of of disneyland and he went to the bank pitched the idea couldn't get the loan but he remembered he had this life insurance policy and he could borrow from the life insurance policy and he didn't have to tell the life insurance company what he wanted it for mm -hmm. and he started disneyland now, now, what was the rate of return on that combined transaction? It was a lot, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. But people would have told him that was a lousy investment to make because whole life insurance has a lousy rate of return. By itself, it does. But in conjunction with other assets, it can be pretty darn good. Brian, right, imagine you get some analytic right now. I'm just kind of thinking of some of the questions that we typically get is I got to imagine that you get some analyticals that approach you and say, hey, you know what? What's the policy earning? What's my loan rate? And what's the difference between that? How do you typically address that with somebody? Well, what's the value of an investment? Value of investment is what you get out of something based on what you put in, Right. It's, it's, it's not what's the spread, what's the dividend rate, what's the loan rate, it's not. Do, 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 you, do you get a fair shake for what you put in versus what you get out? And if you do, that's, that's the thing that you ought to use. You know, we talk about safe withdrawal rates and you know, a safe withdrawal rate is, is, is the rate of consumption of your nest egg in which over 25 to 30 years, you have a reasonably good chance of not running out of money before you run out of life. That's a safe withdrawal rate. But if you take a, a safe withdrawal rate asset, like a mutual fund or something like that, you know, maybe somewhere three, 4%. But if you marry that, that, that asset with a life insurance contract, the distribution rate now can be six, seven, 8%. Okay, depending on how you do it, you can do an all in approach, um, and, and use a life insurance contract to put all your money into and then stream it out through loans against the death benefit, all tax exempt, and you're gonna get six, seven, eight percent distribution rates. Whereas under your, your normal plan, it's three, three to four percent. Now that's value. Now, did I talk about dividend rates or, or loan interest rates? No, because it doesn't matter what you put in versus what you get out. There's other approaches to this, this, uh, this, uh, product that a friend of mine calls the and product mutual funds and life insurance you know where you can be aggressive in paying down your mutual fund account you can you can take out six seven percent knowing you're going to run out of money but when you run out of money because a death benefit's going to come back in and, and and reestablish all the account values for your your spouse or for your beneficiaries you can be a more aggressive in your distribution rate well, you can't put a rate of return to that type of stuff. And again, I didn't talk about dividend rates. I didn't talk about loan rates. That type of stuff doesn't matter. Is what you get out beneficial in relationship to what you put in? That's the value most people are looking for. Well said. Now, Brian, I know one obstacle people 
have when they start looking at whole life policy is what we call the slow start. Meaning those first couple of years, you put in a dollar, you, mm -hmm. your cash value isn't equal to what you put in. It's going to take a couple of years before we say cash flow, meaning mm -hmm. you, when the growth that year equals your premiums. Um, what do you say for people that are kind of hung up on those short term results? Well, if you wanted to start a bank, you know that you have to pay money in order to attract depositors, right? Yeah. And you know that you as a bank make money by lending other people's money out. Now, can you lend other people's money out before you take in other people's money? No. No. So there may be a one, two, three year delay in, in terms of bringing money in before you can start lending money out and making money on it. Now that's a slow start, but no one complains about a bank. It, it, you know, in essence, you're, you're a bank and you've got to capitalize yourself. And there's a ramp in which you've got to climb before you can start lending money out, before you can start utilizing the, the, the funds and the policy. So yeah, there, there's a, there's a, a starting point, but once you get past that, it's unlimited. Brian, what were some of the, uh, you know, you'd mentioned there were some changes and you mentioned that the 7702 or some of the changes they made in regards to life insurance. What are some of the highlights that we can learn in, in the new edition of the book? Yeah. So the, the 7702 rates, this was, uh, a response by the federal government in relationship to the difficulties life insurance life insurance companies were having in terms of their expenses. You know, there used to be an old uh, rule that that you had to guarantee at least 3.75% uh, return and, and, and nobody's getting that on their bonds. So what they did was they reduced the, the guarantee of life insurance contracts, some companies can go as low as 2% now. But what that did was that unleashed um, the power of a life insurance policy, because if you don't have to guarantee as much, well, then you don't have to put up as much reserves, so the expenses go down. And if you don't have to guarantee as much, you, you, can, you can give more non-guaranteed benefits with it. And so, um, because of that change now, now now that's true when you want to live your life insurance okay if you want to die with your life insurance then you should have bought your policy last year <laughs> okay but in in my world you know i want to live my life insurance i i want to consume that death i mean how, how dare me i want to i want to consume my death benefits before i die you know but if, and if i want to do that I don't care about the guarantees. I care about more about how I can use it. And so that's what these new 7702 policies have. Now, there's, there's a whole bunch of lingo in the insurance industry, dividend rate, loan interest rate, mutual company versus stock company, direct recognition versus non-direct recognition. The, the, the list goes on, okay? And how do you cut through all that? Well, the, the best metric that I have found is what I call the distribution rate. Because the distribution rate, again, is how quickly can I take my money out of the policy, okay? And it's irregardless of who has the higher dividend rate, who has the lowest loan interest rate. It doesn't matter whether you're a mutual company or a stock company. It doesn't matter whether you're direct recognition or not. It doesn't matter whether it's a 7702 contract or not. If you can boil it down to the distribution rate, you can find the best policy for you. It's as simple as that. And now you don't have to worry about all the confusing terminology that, that we've been living with for the last hundred years. Hmm, interesting. That's just one of the metrics. There's, yeah. there's a bunch of other metrics to evaluate a life insurance policy. And frankly, anybody that's purchased a life insurance policy in the last 20 or 30 years ought to be taking a look to see if a new 7702 contract might serve them better than the current one that they have. And, you know, again, money in, money out. Which one works better for me? Money in, money out. Doesn't matter anymore. It, 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 it works. 
Brian, I don't know if we asked this last time you were on, but I was curious, what is your take on the IULs or universal life or the, some, the different types of the permanent insurance that are not whole life? Well, let me just say it this way. Any overfunded permanent policy will work. Okay. Hmm. But the, 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 the tendency, unless you're taught well, is to underfund you know, pay as little as possible for it. Well, if you pay as little as possible for it, then you're going to get not a lot out of it. Okay. So they're all work, but I think the, the best example that I can give of a whole life policy versus an, an, an index universal life policy is the effect of borrowing and it back. Okay. So if, 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 if you're working with a whole life company who does not penalize your dividends, when you, decide to borrow the money, then you can borrow money out of the policy, pay it back with the loan interest rate and the cash value and the death benefit is exactly the same after you borrowed and paid it back as it would have been had you never disturbed the money. Now think about that. Think about that. The insurance company did not have $100,000 that should have been in the policy. You've had it deployed over here somewhere for the last 12 years, earning the entertainer's 12% rate of return. So you've had it deployed. Now you bring it back and you pay the insurance company's 4.5% interest on the loan. And the snapshot, as soon as you pay it back, is the cash value and the death benefits look exactly like it would have been had you never taken the money out. That's a whole life policy. You can never do that with a universal life or an IUL because there's hidden fees and expenses associated with not having the money in there. Mm. Well said. You had a question on uh, spending the death benefit or mm. what was that question? Mm. Yeah. Brian, th there, was, <laughs> there was a question we addressed right before and it was, uh, um, it was, what'd you say? It was, if I only get the death benefit. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Now I know yeah, what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> Oh, you know, yeah. a common question, and I'm, I'm getting it a lot lately, is when someone says, well, the the problem with whole life is that when you die, your family only gets the death benefit. The insurance company steals the cash value. Yeah, because you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Let me write that down. Yeah. <laughs> no, you, no, it's because you haven't been taught right. Again. Why what I was taught to be true has turned out not to be. Why on earth would you put all this money into something that you have to die to get and at that and you don't even get it? Why would you do that? If that's what you're going to do, then the insurance company should steal all your cash value because you're stupid. No, you don't do that. What you do is you put your money into a life insurance contract and you stream it out and you start taking and spending your death benefits while you're alive. And then whatever is left is going to be reflective of, of a little bit of cash value just to make sure that it stays alive and it pays a death benefit plus that residual death benefit. You, people have to be, they, they, they just use their life insurance wrong. They think they got to die to get, I mean, I'm driving a brand new car from my dead self. Do you think I'm ever going to pay that, that loan back? I'm not going to pay that loan back. My dead self is going to pay that loan back. And I'm having the time of my life driving it. So, so Brian, if I can, can we make a distinction between like borrowing against the cash value and then also oh. borrowing against the death benefit? You're not doing either. You're borrowing money from the life insurance company. They're a financial institution. Now, they like this because it's a perfect loan. You see, your cash value is your governor. It's, it, it, it's your cap. It's the amount the insurance company will lend you from their money. Okay? Now, I like to say I'm borrowing my death benefit because when I die and I have a loan outstanding, they're just going to reduce the death benefit. So, in a way, I'm using life insurance as money, but I'm actually using my death benefit money. Okay? So, can't, you're never borrowing your cash value. Your cash value is the collateral. It's the governor to tell you how much of the death benefit you can spend using the life insurance money before you die. It, it, it's, a, it's simple finance. We yeah. try to make it so complicated. 
No, no, I like that. I appreciate the explanation because, again, uh, in our industry, there's a lot of different verbiage that's used, and so I, uh, I like that. Yeah, we we have that we have that different verbiage, and it's it's funny to to watch an agent trip over their own words when when you tell them when you're telling your client, well, you're just borrowing your cash value, and the client says, well, why would I want to borrow my own money? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, we paint it because it's not true. It's just a simple financial transaction, but it's money that I'm never going to have. I get to use. And so if, 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 if the, the client's worried that you only get the death benefit and you don't get the cash value, it's because they didn't use their policy, right? Hmm. You mentioned something beforehand to kind of circle back before we kind of wrap this up is you had mentioned this idea of tax stacking. That oh, you're, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. going to address in your oh. book is uh, maybe can you give uh, us a little insight there? It yeah. is so stealthy. It is so stealthy. You see, if you take a hundred thousand dollars out of your IRA, it's taxed in our graduated tax plan up to twenty two percent. Okay, but if you if that triggers your Social Security to being taxable, which it would then your social security sits as the foundational layer of your taxable income and everything else stacks on top of it. And because your social security is taxable at the, at the base level, that puts some of your hundred thousand dollar IRA distribution, maybe in a higher tax bracket because it's all stacked up. So the taxation of social security is one of those things. A capital gain is one of those things. The sale of an asset that has a capital is one of those things. And so we just stack income and it throws what was otherwise going to be taxed at a lower rate. It throws it into a higher rate because we didn't count on these other things, providing a foundation or a step before we start stacking our income. It's very stealthy. You don't realize it. I mean, I did tax returns for years and I didn't even realize that was going on until I stopped to think about it. I go, Wait a minute, what's going on? Oh my gosh, you mean that vaulted the IRA distribution into a higher tax bracket just because he took a distribution? He sold his Amazon stock? That that threw everything else in a higher... Yeah, it did. It's called stacking your taxes. Is that, is that similar to the calculation for provisional income? No, that's, that's a whole different thing because provisional income is what determines whether your Social Security is going to be taxable or not. And what's interesting in that is a non-taxable distribution is called provisional income. This is what gets many seniors all screwed up with, with their Social Security. They got it all figured out. They got all their money in munis, tax-free munis. And then they get their Social Security and they take a distribution from their municipal bond portfolio and they, and they go, wait a minute, what happened? Why is my Social Security taxable? Well, guess what? Municipal bond uh, gains municipal bond distributions are provisional income. Even though you don't have to show the municipal bond interest as taxable income, it's provisional income and it triggers taxation on your social security. So it's a whole different subject. Well, Brian, I apologize for that question from Cameron. I think he was just trying to use some big words and then you kind of shot him down. So. No, no, I'm happy to learn, man. That's why we no. got you here. Yeah. I'm happy well, to watch why you taxes learn. Are, yeah. That's why taxes are so confusing. Yeah ever heard of provisional income that's nutty until it's too late <laughs> well said yeah <laughs> that's when people hear about it uh, yeah and when they when they start paying it yeah that's when it hurts and that's when you learn about it brian so that so that chapter and the new book is out right where can people find it you well this is interesting I, um it's at amazon okay but okay. the book has the word issues in it Wait, it has say, what? say that again. The book has the word true in it. What, what's wrong with that? What I was taught to be true has turned out not to be true. Well, guess what? You uh -oh. can find it on Amazon. So you can't search Amazon looking for just confessions of a CPA. It won't show up. But if you search confessions of a CPA, why? You'll find it. Oh, you're kidding me. I'm not kidding you. They're, they're, uh, they're censoring. Now, they haven't books? told me that they haven't told me that specifically that that's what's going on, but that's, what's been going on for the last month. I cannot get the book listed 
You do Confessions of a CPA, you'll find all three books, including the original one that has the word true in it. But you won't find the new one. Wow. And and they won't tell me why. Hmm. Well, yeah. it's available at Amazon. It's available at Barnes and Noble without censoring. It's Is available there? at Walmart. You okay. can check those websites they're ready to roll perfect we will ha we will find it so it is on amazon it's just maybe if we search by your name or we yeah. will we will have the link uh, in there and yeah. um now it's a great book first of all cool title like who wouldn't <laughs> want to read a, a book about confessions of a cpa like you, right. you got me right there <laughs> yeah i know well i you know i think we talked about it last time a friend of mine kept hammering me to write a book, write a book, Brian, yeah. write a book. I'm not an author. I'm not going to write a book. And then one night I dreamt the title. I go, crap, now I got to write a book. That title's way too good. Yeah, yeah. it is. I believe, yeah, that's, I would have loved to have, to have a dream with that title. That would have been a good, <laughs> uh, yeah, great series. Now you're also working on a fictional book. I am. This one's so, so much fun. It's truly fiction. Um, a dean, a finance dean at a major Midwestern university has, has been found dead on campus. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and the book, the book is all about how one of the traditional professors, you now a traditionalist is, is, the, is, is the one who does it by the book, okay? The textbook stuff that doesn't work in the real world. He has to partner with one of his questioning students who questions everything that the book says and says it doesn't really work in real life. And they have to work together to solve this mystery before the accounting dean gets his life. <laughs> he gets whacked. Or he gets whacked. That's right. And so it's, uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It takes the principles of confessions of a CPA and uses them as clues to who the murderer is. And, and in the middle... Mm is a group called the financial truth club mm. i don't want to spoil it but I, is the murderer dave ramsey <laughs> uh no no okay all right Susie Gorman. no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> uh, awesome brian when's that book coming out hopefully this spring um, okay middle of writing it um and it's um it it fiction is a lot different to write than nonfiction. um but we're crossing the T's and dotting the I's and making sure it's consistent. And uh, hopefully it'll, it'll be out this spring. Well, awesome. Well, we look forward to them not censoring that book mm -hmm. and having an excellent release. And uh, we'll certainly have you back at some later date, Brian. We appreciate you coming on again. Oh, my, my pleasure. Anytime, guys. Thanks, Brian. And go make it a fantastic day. Take care. Thank you.